9.89k subscribers as I record this intro. Who knows, maybe we're already at 10k. But in any case, you can help us over the finish line towards 10k subs, pressing the subscribe button right now. We really appreciate it. The hat is back. I'm back. I will tire of the hat soon, and you guys will not have to look at it anymore. Don't worry. Its days are numbered, but it's here for now, so you just have to accept it. In the meantime, what is the biggest difference between the highly successful professional poker players that many of you guys aspire to be and the budding amateur that's not quite got their shit together yet? The biggest difference is not what you think it is, but it's something that will transform the way you view your own poker career. I'm going to go over some hands today that I just played in a session that I've just come off of, and these hands illustrate one of the biggest differences between those that make it in poker and those that don't. Let's get into it. All right, we've got the replayer up. We've got the kind of fat looking carrots going on here in the background. This is, of course, Carrot Corner Poker Education. The AI built these carrots and it put obnoxious, weird flower petal things all over the place as well. So we just have to accept that AI is going to AI. The biggest difference between the amateur and the pro, in my opinion, apart from the obvious, like the pros better at poker. Yeah, sure. But if we can pinpoint one specific thing, then it's this. When the pro is running bad, the pro's game doesn't fall into pieces. The amateur's game declines significantly. Some days when you start your session, it becomes abundantly clear after the first half an hour that this is not to be a winning day. This is going to be a day where you don't flop very much, you don't hit many sets or straights or flushes, your opponents do, you face constant aggression, you have the bottom of your range over and over again, your bluffs are getting picked off, your steals are getting 3-bet when you have the bottom of your range, your 4-bet bluffs are getting jammed over. It's just one of those days. This is the way it goes sometimes. But what happens here, where there's a kind of sliding doors moment where one person goes one way and the other goes the other way, is that the professional maximizes EV during the losing session. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize the EV of every hand we play like a robot on a conveyor belt, scanning an item and giving it the highest EV possible and sending it on its way. The amateur very often maximizes one of two other things that are not the right things to maximize. The first way the amateur goes wrong is that they try to maximize the chance of getting even. Maximizing the chances that you get even is not the same thing as maximizing your EV because if you try to finish in the black, you will go out of your way to take risks that are probably bad. You will enter pots you shouldn't enter. You will make bluffs that you haven't really properly assessed. You will make calls based on desire instead of folding where you should fold. And you will increase the chances of you breaking even, and sometimes it might pay dividends, and it might even, God forbid, reinforce that behavioral pattern, but very often it will make things much worse. If you have the choice of being down four buy-ins in EV, or being down six in EV, but breaking even a bit more often, you want to settle for being down four buy-ins and breaking even less often. I hope that makes sense, because by trying to break even at all costs, by trying to claw back what you've lost, you're increasing the downside considerably, and you're decreasing your overall EV. Your overall EV is now worse than the negative four buy-ins it would be if you played your A game. So some days your A game returns an expected value of minus four buy-ins on that day, because that's just the way the cards fall on that day. It's not your true EV, but it's your EV for that day if you play your best. The other thing people do, which is just as bad, is that they go into their shell and they try to minimize the chances of finishing really down. They see losing 9 or 10 buy-ins as like an absolute disaster and they want to mitigate that at all costs and they become risk averse, they fall too much, they avoid good bluffs, they retreat behind the walls of their own fears and anxieties and they minimize EV that way. The pro takes all of the good spots, remains objective and maximizes EV. So there are three ways we can go here. We can maximize EV by taking every spot as it comes completely objectively, or we can minimize it by chasing losses and trying to finish even at all costs, or we can minimize it by being risk adverse and retreating into a shell and really hoping we don't end up down 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 buy-ins. The last two ways are what the amateur does most of the time. This session I'm about to show you, I didn't run great by any means, but I played really well and I hung in there and I made the most out of a lot of spots. This is part of the 100 NL Russian Cash Grind Bankroll Challenge that we're building for the subscription site going live in a few months. Let's get into it. I'm not actually going to start with this hand. I want to start at the end because it's way more exciting. Actually, this is the beginning. I played this hand first. We're going to go over these hands in like reverse order in the replayer. So Ace-10 
Ace of Clubs Ten of Spades. A limp from a recreational poker player. We know this because they limped. We raise, they call. Ace, Ace, Seven. Lovely flop. This hand features a concept called fortune reversal, which is where good things are happening and then bad things happen shortly afterwards, and you have to adjust to the loss of the good thing becoming bad. And that's easier said than done, especially when you're having a bad day. We see about the flop small. Bill and calls. We see about the turn big. We could actually use an overbet here as well, especially on double flush draw. I think that might even be better. This hand can get pretty greedy. It's got an amazing kicker. It's doing incredibly well. We're getting called by 7x pocket pairs, weaker ace x flush draws, etc. We're sometimes losing, but let's not worry about that. We go for a nice big river bet here. I think this is fine. And villain jams. Now, my first thought when I was betting the river here was just simply, this is like the easiest bet fold I've ever seen if I get jammed on. When a recreational player jams over your big river bet here, the first thing that you should do is take a step back and realize that it no longer matters that you have trips. Not in the sense that it did before. Previously, it mattered that you had trips because you were getting called by 9x of diamonds, 9x of hearts sometimes, ace x that you beat, 7x, lots of worse hands. But these hands don't play this way. Hands that play this way are either a bluff or a hand that beats you. That means that this hand is a bluff catcher. Even against a recreational player, 9 out of 10 recreational players are not capable of jamming some random ace here. Why would they do it? It's a really horrible play. Most people are not doing that. So if only like 1 or 2 in 10 recreationals even have it in their locker to ever like randomly spew jam with ace 8 here, you can basically say that it's happening hardly ever. Because even the people who do it have other hands in their range as well, diluting those and most people just don't ever do it. That's how you should think about this. In terms of bluffs, while there are some busted flush draws and backdoor flush draws a villain can have, like jack 10 of hearts or king queen of diamonds or queen 8 of hearts or whatever it may be, these hands are incredibly, incredibly unlikely to play this way. This is a very underbluff spot. And in underbluff spots, when you have bluff catchers, you have to fold. You have to accept here that your fortunes have just reversed and you are now against a range of probably just boats for the most part. Ace 7, Ace Deuce, Ace 9, Pocket 9s, Pocket 7s, Pocket Deuces. This is really what you're going to see here the vast majority of the time. If I had to guess how often we win here by calling it off, I would say about 10% of the time. We need like almost 25% equity, by the way, to make this call. Um, I don't think we're getting that. I don't think it's even close to getting that. But many of you call this spot, especially when you're having a bad day. Why? Because your willpower is depleted. You don't want to fold this hand. You just went from value betting an amazing hand to a spot where now you're faced with this. And your brain doesn't want to process that. It doesn't want to recalibrate. It doesn't want to accept that you're now in a spot where you're only beating bluffs and bluffs are few and far between. But that's what you've got to do if you want to ascend to the level that you want to be at. You've got to be ruthlessly objective with yourself here. And you have to say, this isn't about me. This is about the hand. If you make this about you, like, oh, I can't fold this great hand again. Like, they can't have it every time. This isn't fair. Woe is me. Like, if they got it, they got it. It's a cooler. It's a fish. You could be doing anything. If you go down this rabbit hole and you make it about you and your misfortune, you're going to end up calling here out of self-pity and you're going to hate yourself for it. And it's going to just reaffirm this constant loop of making big mistakes in big pots because you don't have the strength, the inner fortitude and the willpower to reassess the situation. I folded here. I love this fold. You definitely have to make it. Villain actually showed me his hand. It's really kind when they do that. Not surprised at all to see a 7 I, I think 90% of the range is A7, A9, A2, A7, A9. Basically. All right, next spot. Ace Jack, open small blind, big blind calls. We go for a small bet here for top pair. You can also check. B4 comes in the turn. You can block, you can overbet, you can bet big, you can check. We rolled the check. You can do everything on this turn when you're out of position. When you can check raise against a small bet, you don't have to bet. When you can check call against a big bet, you don't have to bet. You can bet, you don't have to bet. Grade 1, Lecture 2, Carrot Poker School on value betting. Check it out at carrotconnor.com. The carrots there are better than these. They're not misshapen and bulbous and fat. They're good pointy carrots at carrotconnor.com. Get good carrots there. Bill and Potts it a bit disconcerting. If you have studied Grade E of the Carrot Poker School, if that's out yet, I'll give you a sneak preview. Pot size bets are pretty scary from recreational players. They're scarier than they are against regulars and the scarier than other bet sizes. It's a little tip. That doesn't mean we're folding though, because villain can be bluffing quite a lot here still. They can have a worse hand like ace nine and be making like a kind of borderline polarization mistake. Easy call. 
But then the queen comes. The queen hits like a ton of their bluffing range. I don't think people get here with too many natural bluffs now. Anything with two broadways is no longer a bluff. Anything that's a bluff here is quite combinatorically not very abundant. There's not many combos of bluffs, that's what I'm trying to say. There are some, but I think when we face a large bet again here, Felon's range is filtered on the flop. This is a key point in the hand. Filtered here, a lot of the stuff that could have bluffed river is gone, because if you're like, well, he could have jack eight of diamonds on the river. No, because he called the flop. That's really unlikely. Well, he could have six five. No, because he called the flop, unless it's clubs, really unlikely. So you get the point. Most of the bluff combos are disappearing at this point, and everything else is kind of hitting. Four or five even hits a pair. King jack hits a pair. There's very few combos here that are natural bluffs, and I think our jack is it's okay. I mean, it blocks like king jack, I guess, and the aces. This is an okay bluff catcher for sure, but we're not being any value here, that's for sure. And I think this is an underbluff node after the flop filtering and the pot sizing on the turn. You should fold your bluff catchers in underbluff spots. This is the motto of the day whenever you have those two things. I have a bluff catcher, meaning I only beat bluffs, not value, and the spot is underbluff. We have to fold. We talked about this a few videos ago in the 10 things that bad poker players say video. We folded. We didn't get shown any good news that time. Villain wasn't kind enough to be like, hey, look, I had ace 10. Villain wasn't kind enough to do that, unfortunately. But I like the fold. Backwards is forwards here. Let's keep going backwards. 8-7 off. We peel against UTG. This is close. You can go either way with this one. I think it's a call, though, probably. It depends on the rake structure. We lead on 3-5-6 because 3-5-6 is a phenomenal board for our range, and we can build a donkey range here. This hand can lead or it can check raise or it can check call can do lots of things. Very often we have what I call theoretical options. And if you have three theoretical options, you don't need to lock yourself in a box of like, I must check raise. Or people say things like, I'm going to check raise to rep a set. It's like, yeah, very good. Good for you. But you can also check call and donk bet. So how the hell is your reasoning even logical? You've landed on a line that's just optional based on just like one factor. So get to the theory first. What are your theoretical options? And then do you prefer one in practice? I don't really care what I do here. As long as I don't like fold. Open fold the flop, that's bad. So we call here, we could also probably 3-bet, but it depends how often people are jamming on us. Like, that would be really bad for this hand, but definitely this hand can 3-bet, and I did roll between 3-betting and call here, roll to call, fine. Check the turn, villain checks back, this will be really capping, people won't check enough sets or flushes on this node for sure, they're going to have way too much, like queens, jacks, tens, nines, kings, this is going to be the majority of their range. So even though we bink the river here, and we hit a pair, and we're now winning against some out-and-out -out bluff, that we're praying just went for a flop raise like king queen of diamonds and then check turn and isn't going to reignite river we're praying all these things are true if we check here in essence i think we have very little realizable showdown value but what about our range our range is like fucking great we have set still although we three bet them on the flop a lot but we have some we have tons of flushes loads and loads of flushes we have straights yeah this just has to be a really strong range spot for us after he checks back turn so i am bluffing and I'm going to go big, because when somebody's range is capped, because they've taken a line that pool just isn't going to protect enough, like they're just not going to have a flush here. Pyle's going to have a flush here. Pyle's a real pain that way. Pyle Solver's going to be like, yeah, well, I'm going to check my flush, and sometimes you'll do this, and I'll maximize EV. Haha, <laughs> gotcha. But this guy's not doing this, probably. This person's probably not. So I, I love this play. Phil and tanked for like 30 seconds here, and then folded, which was somewhat of a relief. But here's the thing. Mental game coaching. Before you make this play, make peace with it. Be like, I have logical arguments for this play. I'm going to go through them. I've justified this play. Yeah, you might have a bit of apprehension about being called, but make this play with conviction that it's right and that you back yourself and have the confidence to accept being called before you make this play. If you're going to get called here, fine. Try and live with that first. Try and imagine it and accept it first, because if you don't, then you may fall into the trap, my friends, of ouch, I should never have where you get snapped by an outlier hand that doesn't usually exist, or you get stationed by an unusual player type that's unusually stationary, and you say, oh man, I should never have done that. And congratulations, you've just trained yourself to play like an absolute C-game reg, an absolute net reg for the rest of your life, and you're going to perish in the depths of redline misery because of that. So make peace with your bluff before you make it, if you know what's good for you. So that one worked. 10 nine of clubs, go for the small one here little isolation three bet against the weaker player could take or leave this spot villain calls again we're not connecting we're not hitting stuff we're not hitting well here in big pots we're not entering plus ev preflop situations and then binking sets and stuff like that that's not happening today we're getting the worst of it but we're trying to maximize our ev anyway accepting we're probably going to have a losing day but we're going to try and play well 
That's what pros do better than amateurs, remember. And it's the biggest thing. The reason it's the biggest thing is that the amateur's game can really fall off a cliff when they're running bad. So if the pro can just go from A game to B game instead of A game to N game or Q game or Z game, then that's a huge deal. Your game not falling into a million pieces is a pretty huge deal. That makes you a lot better than the people whose game does fall into a thousand little pieces when they run bad. They donk the flop here. How dare they? This is my board. What are they doing? Oh, they shouldn't do this! Oh yeah, so what? Like, how does that help you? That's a stupid thought, right? They shouldn't do this. Who cares? What's a good thought then? Well, what are they doing it with, right? That's a good thought. They're doing it with usually a mergey range. They'll have some nutty stuff sometimes. They usually won't have pocket eights. That's just very underrepresented here. What you will see at high frequency is stuff like queen jack, king jack, king ten, ace king, king queen, less king queen, tens, jacks, nine ten, a piece of the board, ace jack of spades, queen jack of spades, queen ten of spades. You'll see all this kind of stuff. Ace five of spades. A mergey range. This is almost a fold. My hand is really terrible against that range. I do have a gutter because of the gutter and the implied odds that are going to come from that because on my gutter making card, Bellum will make two pair and we'll have a set sometimes and stuff like that. I think I can probably peel this, but this is honestly not far from a fold already. Check and I decide to start bluffing. I figure my showdown value here is pretty low. If villain has like ace jack of spades and wants to play passively great, I'll just bet here and I'll win when a spade doesn't come one way or the other. And if villain has a hand like queen jack, king jack, king ten, tens, nine ten, jack nine, jacks, ace king, queen ten, etc. I'm going to just blast off. So I'm going to fire here and I'm going to jam the river and I'm going to expect there to be too much of a belt of hands that can call one but not two here. I really do feel like we can lure our opponent into calling once and then folding the next street at pretty high frequency. Here's a rule for you guys that I thought about when I was on my walk today with my dogs. I was thinking about this hand. That's why I do. I go out on a walk and think about a hand I just played for 20 minutes. And I thought, well, here's a good rule for the audience. If you can see a large band of very uncomfortable looking hands in your opponent's range against a certain action, and you don't have much showdown value, you should probably take that action. So here I envisioned a large group of hands in villain's range that absolutely hated life when I did this. Because like, I'm saying I have two pair plus here probably, and when villain has ace king, or worse, this is grim. Sure they might not fold, I might run into like a stationary fish, but it's a fallacy that fish don't fold here. Fish are capable of folding one pair here pretty often. I got another sweat here, the guy tanked and tanked and tanked, and tanked, and tanked, and then eventually folded. But I'd made peace with getting called before I did it. I was like, you know what? I back myself in this game. I think I'm a big winner in this game. I am not afraid to pull the trigger here. My self-worth does not depend on this bluff getting through. If it gets snapped off, that's poker. That's poker, folks. That's part of life. And I'm going to deal with that and I'm going to be okay. And I'd rather it didn't, but I will be okay if it does. And that is the mentality of permanent confidence. Not just... Oh, it worked. Now I'm suddenly confident for a few hands. I have bravado. Oh no, I got crushed again. That is fickle confidence that comes and goes. It is wispy. It's not real. It's not concrete. It's not permanent. That's not the confidence you want. You don't want to be a glass cannon. You don't want that kind of confidence. You want the kind of confidence that can survive in bad conditions as well as good ones. So be okay with the outcome before you make the bluff. Queen 9, we call big blind versus under the gun in this one. Bill and bit small. We decide to peel here. Super thin. I think like three-way mix is in order here. You can probably raise, call, or fold with this hand, and it's all close to zero. The saving grace is that people range bet, so I kind of like continuing. If they don't range bet here, because they only bet like 75% of the time, this is probably a three-way mix. I don't know. You can look up in your solvers. We turn a queen, villain checks back. Easy value button, the river. GTO sizing here is probably 75% pot. If you want to overbet here and really say hey, I'm repping an 8, but I have hardly any 8s, then you can do that, and you probably get looked up a lot in this spot. So I, I like overbet here as well, but I'd be 75 and do get called by 6s, which I think is a decent bluff catcher. I mean, I don't have a lot of bluffs containing a 6 here. I think most of my bluffs contain a 9 through jack, so 6s is probably a reasonable hand to look me up with. It's probably break even. But this could be an overbluff spot if people are calling the flop too wide and then not value betting wide enough on the river and, you know, just having too many air hands. Maybe bluffing too far up into their ASEX showdown value or something. Could be overbluffed, so villain's call is probably alright. Just look to this hand. King deuce now. So min open, this guy looked like a reg. I peel. 
The flop is 10 6 deuce rainbow. They bet just over half pot. I call. Normal stuff. Ace on the turn. Check, check. We have showdown value here. We're doing pretty well. I don't really feel the need to turn this into a bluff. If I did bluff, I would overbet. I don't think I have a ton of hands that want to overbet for value. I have like ace 10, ace 6, ace deuce. But apart from that, I don't have a lot. I'm going to raise a lot of my sets on the flop, but not all of them. You probably can mix this into just overbet or check in GTO. I doubt there's ever any smaller bet going on. That wouldn't make any sense. So we decide to check as is normal. And Villain says that he has a set or two pair, basically. That's what Villain is saying now. <sighs> but Villain started in a small blind. Villain started with this really wide base range, yet they're saying they have two pair plus. And call me a skeptic, but I think it would be easier to under bluff here than over bluff. When you bet 2x pot, you still need to have value 60 40. 60 value combos to every 40 bluffs, 60 40. That's the ratio, because I need 40% to call this. I don't think Villain's achieving that. I think Villain is bluffing here at least half of the time. And I think this call is wildly winning. And I think that whenever a wide base range, like a small blind range, claims to have very few value combos and claims to have slow played them on the previous street, not fucking buying it. Don't believe you. You're toast, mate. I call. Unfortunately, we ran into it. I'm just kidding. He was bluffing. King seven of spades. So God knows how wide the bluffing range was. You could easily go into your shell. Remember at the start, I said... What are the ways that amateur poker players minimize their EV, fail to maximize EV in bad sessions and fall apart due to bad variants? And one of the things they do is they go into their shell and they're just like, I'm not calling a 2x spot bet. I'm down enough. I'm not doing this. You know, I'm running bad today. I can't hit better than one pair. Like I literally couldn't hit anything in this session, but I still played really well and, and limited the damage. I maximized EV. And that is what you need to do when you're running bad. That's what you need to do. Okay, on to ace four, the final hand of the day. This one was a very close peel pre. Like, this hand is dreadful here, but you're getting like six trillion to one. Okay, just six to one. Close enough, five and a half to one. But I think you want to call. I think you want to play a pot against two weaker players with a wheel ace. I think these were weaker players. Ace three three, check it over. Seven turn. You can bet something like half pot or third pot here. You can check. It doesn't really matter. And on the river, this king is such a great card. Because now we get to bet big and get called by a king. This hand is only in there to show you that your opponents are waiting to give you your money back when you're losing and you're a winning player in the pool. Don't sabotage yourself just because you're losing today. Imagine throwing away your win rate just because you're having a bad day. Every time you have a bad day, you double your loss rate because you're glass cannon, you fall apart, you don't have real confidence. And this is me, by the way, sometimes this has been me in the past when I used to play professionally. I really struggle with bad stretches, so don't think that I'm preaching here. It is tough. But this is stuff I coach people on every day these days. It's one of the most common things I coach people on. And it's how to just say, well, your opponents in a spot like this are sometimes just going to give you money. This guy just called with jacks. And then this guy called behind with king jack. This has got to be so many levels of wrong in GTO. Like, this is so, so wrong. And we just got called in two spots with ASX. Like, like, they're just waiting to give you your money, you know? So just be patient. Your job in poker is not to force things when you're not given the good hands. Your job in poker is to survive, bluff in key spots, pick off bluffs in key spots, play accurately, and then you will be rewarded. Okay, this was only a small reward, but you'll be rewarded by fish like this in much greater magnitude. Like, people are going to give you stacks pretty soon if you can just hang in there. The downswing is going to be over, the bad session will only last so long, and a plus nine buy-in session is just around the corner, even if it doesn't feel like it. That's going to happen. But you don't want to have punted off nine buy-ins by the time it happens. You'd like to be up after that. So imagine that light at the end of the tunnel. Think about the fact that you're in this for the long haul, and your job in each and every day that you play is to maximize your EV. And if you go from A game to B game when you're running bad, or A game to C plus game, that's okay. That's kind of normal. We can work on it. We can maybe get it to the point where you can play A minus when you're running bad and A when you're running good or something like that. But if you go down to F game or N game or Z game, Z game for Americans, that's going to make things very difficult. The cat has just decided to infiltrate the video at the very end. Sorry about this, guys. I, think, I guess this is, this is a sign that we should be wrapping up now. I can't see you anymore. Yeah, let's wrap up there. It's carrotcorner.com for all of our educational content. This is like a fucking comedy sketch right now that I didn't even plan. This is awful. Yeah, kind of funny. Carrotcorner.com. We have loads of loads and loads more education on there. I'll see you next time for more of this content. Do subscribe. Help us get past that 10k mark. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.